hard, but there's like shit ton of projects and crap like that. Yeah, it looks like he's, re he's recording the. Hey, I don't even end the piazza. How do I get into All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to CS 451, 651, 431, and 631, or what we call big data, because if I want to say the full name, we run out of time. Uh, my name is uh, Ali Abedi. I am your instructor for this course. Um, can you confirm that you can hear me well? Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. So um, uh, let's uh, start. Um, uh, before we begin, uh, this course is uh, fully online. Uh, this lecture will be live on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I will record it. And please remind me to start recording in case I forget. I have started recording today, so we should be fine. And I will post these lectures on YouTube after, usually a few hours after uh, the lecture. I have a playlist that I will share, and you can just see when a new video is added to the playlist. Uh, so that's how we do this. So uh, I decided to have uh, the course fully online because I believe that we are still in the middle of a pandemic. And if even if all of us are vaccinated, there is a chance that we get ill. So um, for now, this term, the course will be online. Uh, having the course online uh, has some issues. For me, I cannot see you guys, so it's, it's a little bit difficult for me to get feedback. So if you are comfortable, I encourage you to turn on your video so that I can see your faces. It will be much more interactive for me and it uh, helps me uh, keep my energy up. <laughs> so it's much better. All right, thank you. And you can see my screen, right? All right. OK, so this is the plan for today. I'm going to introduce myself. I'll talk about what big data is and where it comes from and why we should care about big data. And finally, I'll talk about course structure. So who am I? I got my PhD from here in 2017. Uh, I'm a faculty member in the Systems and Networking Research Group, uh, uh, and this is my fifth time teaching this course. So the students in the previous terms could not kick me out of school with their evaluation, so it's your time now this term to see if you can get rid of me. All right, so what is big data? OK, so to answer this question, I have to answer to other questions. So wh what is big data uh, and where does it come from? First, we have to look at how much does it cost to store data? And the second question is, how much data do, do we generate, right? Because these are the two main things uh, that basically cause big data. Let's answer the first question. And let me know if you have any questions. You can raise your hand in the option, uh, or you can type it mm, uh, in the chat box. The preference would be you talk. It will be much more interactive and uh, much more fun. OK, <laughs> but if you can't, chat box is fine. All right, how much does it cost to store data? Uh, I need to show you the evolution of a storage over time. Let's go back to 1950s. What you see? being loaded onto a, an aircraft is a hard drive that with the capacity of four megabyte under four megabyte and as you can see it's so heavy that they need a lift 
uh, and it was so expensive that no one could buy it and they had to rent this device, okay? <laughs> All right, that is crazy. Let's move to 1980s, okay? Things get much better. At least the thing that you see on the paper looks like hard drives. 10 megabytes for over $3,000. Now people can buy it actually, 10 megabytes. Today, you can buy an eight terabyte disk for $160. So much, much cheaper today. And by the way, you cannot use this slide for price check at Best Buy. This is US dollar prices. All right. In Canada, you expect over $200, I think, for that disk. And with the chip shortage, I think even more. OK, so let's actually quantify this, see how much uh, it costs to store data over time. And I forget about uh, 50s, OK? That was crazy. Let's just start from 80s, OK? On the y-axis, I show you how much money you need to spend to buy one gigabyte of data. The, the y-axis is logarithmic, so it's crazy. 1980s, over $300,000. You could buy a very nice house back then. Okay, one gigabyte of data. And as you move forward 10 years each time, you can see that the, the price is reduced by orders of magnitude. Every time I cross one of those lines, that's 10 times less. It's logarithmic, right? And today, we are talking about one to two cents per gigabyte. I think it is clear uh, how cheap the disk uh, or uh, the storage in general uh, storage cost is. So I joke about this. I have solved uh, the money problem for time travel, right? So if somebody says we don't have money for building time uh, travel machine, there's no problem. So you take hard drives back to 1980s and then you sell them and you go to 2000, you buy Bitcoin and come back to 2020, 2021, okay? And then <laughs> you get a lot of money. All right, so let's move on to the next question. So we know that disk storage is cheap. How much data do we generate? This will be fascinating for you. I'll start with some examples, okay? And then I talk about aggregated data. Some examples, Facebook alone generates four petabytes of data every day. A petabyte is a thousand terabytes. Just Facebook, right? The images, people share videos, everything. Four petabytes of data by Facebook every day. On Twitter, we have five million tweets, tweets every day. And that's after Twitter banned Trump. So it was much more than that before. So on YouTube, this one we presented as, instead of bytes, we presented as time. Over 700,000 hours of YouTube video every day on YouTube. That is crazy. Do the math. I think it's, I forgot. Is it like 50 or 70 years worth of video every day on YouTube? And finally, IoT devices. This one is interesting in particular because IoT devices typically do not generate a lot of traffic, right? These are like temperature sensors or things like this. Their bandwidth is like kilobits per second or even minute, right? So they don't generate a ton of data, but there are or there will be many of them in the world, right? It is expected that by 2025, in a few years, we have 75 billion IoT devices. And you can do the math, you can multiply that number by like one kilobit per second, something like that, something very low. And you can see that it will be a ton of data. So these were some examples, right? We generate much more data than this. It is not a very exact science to tell you exactly how much data we generate today. It's very tough. This is a conservative estimate of how much data we generate today. It is estimated that we generate 2.5 exabytes, which is 2.5 million terabytes of data generated each day. 
Okay, so the hard disk in your laptop is probably one or two terabytes. So we need like a million laptops basically to store all of the data that we generate in a single day. And that would be like 300,000 of those eight terabyte disks. The interesting thing is that 90% of the data that we have today was generated only in the last two years. So basically any data that we generated before COVID is only 10% of the data that we have today. That's crazy. It is estimated by 2025 we have, we generate uh, close to 500 exabytes of data per day. And that would be close to 60 million of those eight terabyte disks, okay? Just to have a sense of what that means, I, I can visualize it for you. So from Waterloo to where you want to do your next co-op, okay? So it will be hard disks all the way and back. So that's the amount of data that we will generate in a single day uh, in a few years. All right, now I answer the question of where big data comes from. We generate a ton of data, right? Storage is cheap. So we have a lot of data, it's cheap to store it. So we basically store any garbage that we produce, okay? Uh, sometimes companies store data, that they have no idea why they are storing, okay? They are hoping that tomorrow they do data mining and find something, but today they just store the data. They have no idea why, okay? Why? Because it's cheap, right? It costs Google nothing to store your data, so they will store everything, okay? And as a result, we have huge data sets that are gigabytes, terabytes, or even petabytes of data in a single data set. And that creates big data. This is what we are going to talk about in this course. The issue is when you have a data set that's so big, nothing works. Like for CSS students at least, whatever that you have learned during the last three, four years, almost nothing works on a, tra on a file that's one petabyte. The simplest algorithms fail when the file is so big. So this is what we are going to focus in this course. So that was big data, but why should we care about it, okay? I'm going to answer or talk about this in three different domains, in business, science, and society. So I'm going to provide you examples of why we care about big data in these domains. In business, the short answer is it makes money. How? Well, we have a concept called business intelligence. It is very simple. It says when a business has a process, it should basically gather data from that process to gain some insight in order to improve that process. We will say, though, that's, that's obvious. And it's not a new idea. In, uh, back in 1990s, Walmart did a study and they found that people tend to buy diapers and beer together, right? So they put these two items together and they increase sales, right? So it's not a new idea. What has changed? We have more storage capacity, as we just talked about, and we have more computation capacity. And we can gather user behavior much, much easier. Uh, back then, they had to do studies to figure out like what people buy and things like that. Today, things are ha things happen on the internet. It's very easy to collect your behavior, and we see examples of this everywhere. On Amazon, for example, when you buy something, right, or you look at one of the items, it says customers who viewed this item also bought other stuffs, right? So these are recommender systems based on collecting user behaviors, figuring out that if someone uh, views item A, they tend to view item B. So if someone looks at item A, I recommend item B to that customer. Similarly on Netflix, for example, because I watched Better Call Saul, Netflix uh, recommend Fargo and Homeland, right? Because they're similar or people who watch 
Better Call Saul, also watch those other movies, right? And as I said, at the end of the day, it makes money uh, for businesses and it involves a ton of data, right? You can imagine that like how much data it, Amazon has from user behavior, right? The second uh, uh, example is science. Why do we care about big data in science? Well, uh, we are in a new era in science in which we have equipment that generate tons of data because all of these equipments are connected to a computer and these sensors collect a lot of data. I'm going to show you a few examples here. I love physics, so it's mostly from physics. If you remember, uh, uh, we had the first image of a black hole a few years ago, right? Uh, you might be interested to know that to generate that photo, they collected 4.5 petabytes of data. So again, petabyte is a thousand terabytes, okay? Uh, so that took them a, a roughly a thousand hard drives to store the data and they and they used truck trucks and planes to move the data okay from one place to another one. and that's because they did not take this course right another example of generating a ton of data in science is the ska telescope this is an international project uh, that's going to build this huge telescope that is basically an array of telescopes in a one kilometer by one kilometer square uh, space, basically. And uh, it is planned. It's, it is still in the planning phase. I'm not sure if they started building it. It's a very ambitious project. The data science part of this project is a challenge on its own because this telescope will generate five terabits per second. We do not even have the technology today to handle this much data. The last category of why we care about big data is society. So we have a concept called humans as social sensors. What does that mean? I think all of us or most of us have uh, social uh, war, we are on social media, right? And we see something or we observe something and we post something about it on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, right? So we are like sensors that detect something and we report it there, right? We talk about our feelings, about the situation, about COVID, about everything, right? So we are like sensors and there are so many of us. So we generate so much data and it's possible that we basically mine this data and find out what people think or we predict all sorts of crazy things. Let me show you some examples. We have a category of research papers that can be basically summarized like this. They, they predict something using Twitter data, okay? And this example, I had it from before COVID and it makes more sense now. Uh, so this is about predicting the spread of a disease using Twitter data, only using Twitter. So we don't get access to any other data, source of data, just Twitter. The, the solid line is basically what we predict to be uh, the spread of the disease, okay? And the dashed line is uh, the ground truth. You can see this is crazy, right? We have a such a good match between these two lines, right? It's crazy that just using Twitter, we could predict uh, the spread of the disease. For this reason, when uh, COVID started, I uh, designed a final project for uh, CIS 451 and 651 uh, to predict the spread of COVID-19. We could actually uh, predict the end of the first wave but we could not figure out that there will be many more waves coming after that. So to conclude, this is how big data beca became the new hot topic. Okay, sorry about the little bit inappropriate slide. So um, how can we tackle big data? So we know what it is. We know why it's important. I now want to explain how to approach solving this problem, basically, 
in at a very high level. Okay, uh, the rest of the term will be explaining this in more detail. Is there any question before I move on? All right. <clears throat> so, to tackle big data, we need the scaling. I don't know if you are familiar with this term from other courses, but let me uh, define it uh, quickly. So, scaling is basically increasing your computation and storage power according to the load that you have. Okay. So, if you have, for example, if I have uh, more users visiting my website, the scaling means that I also increase my computation capacity to serve those uh, users, right? So I scale or change my computation power according to the input to that problem. That's called the scaling, okay? Now, we have two types of scaling. Uh, the first one is vertical scaling or scaling up. And I think many of you uh, have done this already. For example, if you have upgraded your desktop or laptop, for example, by adding a memory module, that is vertical scaling. It means that you made a single machine more powerful, right? And then if we have, if we need a stronger machine because I have to do more work, I can upgrade it even more, right? So there's a single machine and we keep, uh, uh, making it stronger, right, or more powerful by adding more CPUs if we can, or add more memory modules, things like that, right? The issue with this type of scaling is that it soon becomes extremely expensive, right, to have a single machine that has a lot of memory or a lot of processing power. It's super expensive. Even more importantly, it is limited, right? Even you, if, if even if you don't have the money concern, it has a limit, right? You cannot push a single machine too much, right? There's a limit on how much you, a single server can be powerful. So this approach is expensive and limited. This is again vertical scaling or scaling up. We have a different type of scaling which has a very different approach. It's called horizontal scaling or scaling out. What does that mean? So I have a machine, it runs out of capacity, I need more capacity. Instead of making that machine more powerful, I add another machine. This is horizontal scaling or scaling out. And then if you run out of capacity again, you add more machines, okay? So because you add cheap machines, overall, this is a much cheaper solution compared to vertical scaling. And this is what we like, and this is what we use in this course. The issue with horizontal scaling is that previously in vertical scaling, if you had an application, right, you could add more memory to that machine, right, and the app still works, right? It's a single machine, it still works, it's now faster, so it can uh, basically support more load. But now the issue here is that as soon as you move from a single machine to two machines, it is not trivial how to actually scale our program, right? Can we run two copies of the program? It may not necessarily work, right? How about the coordination between these for, between these two instances of the program, right? Because they need to figure out what the other one is doing, right? So the scaling, uh, our application is not trivial, and this is called distributed computing, okay? So this to distribute uh, the workload among multiple machines and somehow aggregate the results. That's distributed computing. And someone pointed out single, single point of failure. That's also true. Although those super expensive machines have uh, built-in redundancy, but in general, yes, they are more prone to single point of failure. It's a good point. So, okay, the, we, th we think this is a good solution for scaling, right? Because when we need more capacity, 
we can add more cheap machines. That's really beautiful. We really like it. But the problem is, how can we run a program on multiple machines? That is not trivial, OK? So uh, this is called distributed computing, and it means that components of a software system is distributed on multiple network computers, OK? In this course, we look at data intensive distributed computing. So a type of distributed computing that handles a ton of data as input. That's how, it how it's different from the normal distributed computing. And we have a course on distributed computing. That's a separate course. We focus on data intensive distributed computing. All right. So if you care about a project that needs a lot of processing, this is actually not uh, the suitable course <laughs> because we care about applications that handle a lot of data that don't necessarily have a ton of computation to do. All right, let's talk more about this. How can we use multiple machines to do something? Well, we know that even on a single machine, we parallelize uh, our solution by having multiple threads or processes, right? Uh, at least our CSS students know about this. They have probably written programs that handle a problem by having multiple threads or processes, things like this. So we can make the computation parallel even on a single machine. But even there, it is very challenging, right? Because we have to think about shared memory access between the threads or message passing, all of those archi uh, architectures, and also so many other things that as soon as we have multiple threads, we have to think about locks, condition variables, deadlocks, live lock, race condition. This is CS350 for CSS students. Hopefully I did not bring back a lot of dark memories from that course. I don't think it's your favorite course. <laughs> so, so this was a single machine, right? One server, one machine. Now, if you expand this to multiple machines, you have all of those problems, plus you have to deal with a cluster of machines. The cluster of machines is basically a, a set of servers that are networked together. OK, so now the scale goes from a single machine to a scale of a cluster or even multiple data centers. And now imagine what happens if I have like 100 or 1,000 servers it is very likely that one of them dies, right? So what happens? So, the, so everything grinds to a halt. Uh, we, it's, it's crazy, right? It's, it's very challenging, right? It's very difficult. So, and you have so many interactive services running on these machines, making things even much more complicated. Questions? Are we good? So the bottom line is that it is very difficult, right? So it's difficult on, a, on one machine, and it's much more difficult on a cluster of machines. And it doesn't matter what you do, it ends up in something like this, OK? Which we don't like. So OK, so we are going to work with a cluster of computers. And again, to remind you, this is because we chose horizontal scaling, right? We want to add machines instead of making a single machine more powerful, right? So we have a set of machines and we want to run a program on top of these machines. As, as I explained, it is very difficult, very challenging, right? So how can we do this? In order to answer this question, let me actually give you another example that you are more familiar with. So all of you have written a program, right? that runs on top of a CPU, right? AMD, Intel, different generation, doesn't matter, right? So now I have a question for you. You guys have developed those programs without knowing the exact uh, way that these CPUs work. I don't think any of us know the exact architecture of any CPU, right? Sometimes we write a program, we don't even know what is the underlying architecture. So my question is, how come we can still program without knowing what's happening inside the CPU? 
we know a little bit, right? I don't want to insult you, but we don't we don't know exactly what's happening there, right? No, none of us know exactly how Core i9 works. What we can program? How? Any volunteer? Just go ahead and speak. Um, professor, just like we can drive a car without knowing what's going inside the car. I, I didn't get the first part. Say say that again. Um, I'm saying that it's just like how we can drive a car without knowing what goes on in the engine. That's good, right? So that is the answer. But like why? Exactly why this is possible? That that was a good that's a good point. Right, you are referring to something very important here, abstraction. Separating what we want to do from how it's done, right? So the driving the car example is also very nice. I like it because there's an abstraction, right? There's an interface for you. You don't care about how the engine works, right? So you have a steering wheel, right? And you have the pedals, right? And some other mechanisms, right? So there's an API. So that's how you interact with the car, right? So that API abstracts away the complexities of the rest of that system, right? So in the case of the car, it abstracts away how the engine works, right? Don't care, right? Because the, the API just tells you, here's the steering wheel, turn left or right, right? Don't care about how it's done. Same for the CPUs, right? CPUs say, okay, it's super complex. There's an instruction set, right? that says, okay, I can add two numbers, and this is the instruction, so you can tell me to add numbers. Don't worry about how I do it, right? This is how, and this is why we can write programs. And obviously there are higher levels, or as you mentioned, uh, multi-levels of abstraction, right? We have assembly, we have higher le levels of uh, uh, languages, doesn't matter. The, the overall picture is abstraction. So we separate what we want to do, adding two numbers, from how it's done, loading it into this reg register, loading the second number into the register, uh, do this, do that, right? Separating these. So for CPUs, it's using an API or the instruction set. For how about our problem? So we have a super complex system, a cluster of computers. We don't like the complexities of these systems. Can we abstract it away? Yes, it's possible, right? So we need a system in between that we can tell it what we want to do, right? And we don't worry about how it's done. We, in general, we need two things, a storage mechanism, so that if we have like a one petabyte data set, we can just tell it to store this file and I don't want to know how you do it, okay? I just want a clean API, I can open the file, I can read the file, I do not care how you do it, <laughs> okay? And also for computing, right? We want to write programs to do something, right? To process this data set. How? Well, uh, again, give me an API so that I tell you what to do. You figure out the rest. And this will be the topic of the next few sessions. So like three next sessions are talk about different systems that enable such abstraction. It's really clean, it's really beautiful, right? It's a system that you just define a function, define one or two functions, and it works. It can be on your laptop, it can be on Amazon with a thousand servers, it doesn't matter, it's the same function. You just pass that to the system, it works magically. It's so beautiful. We're going to talk about that. Questions? And I should somehow, I think I forgot to switch to the participant window in case you have a question. If it was possible that I missed it, I'm sorry. So you can use raise hand again uh, if you have any questions. All right, uh, so we've got a question. It's 
it's a very good question. Uh, the question I read the question for you. Why do the two situations of processing a lot of data versus doing a lot of computation need different types of solutions and infrastructure? Um, I, I will talk more about this in the next uh, few uh, sessions, but a uh, high level um, or like a, an example, an example. When you work with a lot of data, your most of your computation is IO bounded, right? Because you're reading and writing a lot of data. When you do computation, regular computation, it's mostly CPU bound, right? It's always instructions, instructions. Now, why this is important? Well, it impacts because we need to optimize these underlying systems, right? Should we optimize for better I.O. or better computation? So this is a very high level answer and you will see examples of this and more like more detailed examples of this during this course. You will see, oh yeah, because I have to move like a terabyte of data, this architecture makes sense. For example, another one is that when you when you have a compute intensive workload, you don't care about moving data around because you don't have a lot of data, right? So you can move it from this machine to another machine. But if I have one petabyte of data, you have to be careful about moving data around, right? You don't want to move data as much as possible. You want to work on local data as much as possible. So that's the difference. Good question. Let me know if I could answer your question. All right, any other question? Let me go back to the participants window. I don't see anything. OK, so let's move on. Let's talk about the course. OK, so that was a very high level introduction. I will talk more about what we will learn in this course and how we are going to organize the course. Uh, you are probably a little bit confused about why there are so many courses here. It says 451, 651, 431, 631. OK, so first of all, each course has undergrad and grad version. That's why we have four and six. So that's half of it. And then we have four, five, and then four, three. That's for CS uh, major. And uh, uh, 431 or 631 is for non-CS uh, uh, students. That's why we have a combination of four different uh, types of students here. So uh, the the way this course uh, uh, was taught before COVID, I had separate lectures for 451 and 431 um, and the corresponding grad uh, session, obviously. But uh, when we moved online, the number of participants went down because some students cannot attend live lectures or they pre prefer to watch the recorded version. So it didn't make sense to have the lectures twice. So we have combined the, all of the lectures into one because the content of the lectures um, are the same. Actually, the reason that we had separate lectures was to uh, have a better environment for students with different background to ask questions. But here, because we have fewer uh, students attending the lectures, we still have that environment. Uh, I think everybody uh, feels or should feel uh, free to ask any questions, OK? So this is a complex topic, and sometimes I do not know the answers either. So please ask questions. So this is the story about the structure of the course, OK? Four sessions. Um, as I said, lectures are the same. Assignments are different. I'll talk about that. So what is this course about? So let me talk about big data stack. So we start with execution infrastructure. So this is the infrastructure that enables that abstraction that I talked about, okay? That will be the topic of the next few sessions. And then we have analytics infrastructure. These are the algorithms that we design specifically for big data problems. And finally, at the top of the stack, we have data science tools. These are the tools that enable uh, doing, data, uh, doing data science. This course, uh, talks about all of these components, but it is mostly focused on the middle one, the algorithm design. Uh, it's a hot topic, so there are many buzzwords, okay? 
uh, map reduce a spark, pig, hive, no skull, prickle, uh, giraffe. As you can see, there are so many animals here. So I promise to introduce the entire zoo during the term. <laughs> Uh, then we have at the top of the stack, we have data science tools, right? We talk about business intelligence, data science, data warehouses, and things like that. And most importantly, the majority of the term will be talking about algorithm design. We talk about different types of data, and as a result, different types of algorithms. For example, when we work with text, how can we process it, right? When we have a trace that's one terabyte of text. Or how about a graph that's too big, like Facebook has like 2 million sorry, 2 billion nodes, right? The friendship graph is a huge graph. We cannot write run Dijkstra on it, okay? So we need to design new algorithms to process huge graphs. Relational data, we will see that traditional SQL databases fail when we have huge amount of data and unstructured. We have data mining. How can we mine the data? It's a really, really cool topic. Again, we have a ton of data. How can we do classical classification, uh, clustering problems. And finally, what happens when we have a stream of data instead of having a stored data set offline? How about when the data keep coming? For example, if we are uh, processing Twitter data, right, we keep getting new tweets, right? How can we process them? Again, we'll talk about a few very cool algorithms. So Again, the focus of the course is on algorithm design and thinking at the scale. We want to teach you how to approach a problem where the input is a big data set. Okay. As I said, it's really interesting because most of the things that you have learned already don't work. So, uh, let's talk more about the topics that we are going to talk about. In the first few sessions, we talked about core frameworks. We'll talk about Apache Hadoop and Ap Apache Spark. These are the systems that enable that, that abstraction I talked about. Then we move on to, talk, uh, to talking about algorithm design, analyzing text, graphs, relational data, and uh, data mining. And at the end of the term, towards the end of the term, we talk about uh, what's beyond batch processing, and that's specifically talking about the stream of data. When we have a stream of data, how can we basically modify these algorithms to work? Uh, to give you an idea of how much time you need to spend on this course, I looked at the previous term uh, in the winter uh, evaluation to see how much students said they spend time. So for 451, 651, for our CSS students, they said 5.5, 9.5 hours a a week. That's including lectures, assignments, everything. And uh, for this one is interesting. 431, 631, it used to be nine hours in the fall 20. I don't know what happened. Students report 7.5 last term. Nothing changed. So be careful. It might be closer to nine hours, not seven. Uh, so you know about these, I've already posted uh, these on Piazza, so the course website. Um, communication will be done mostly or entirely on Piazza, okay? So you have questions, ask it on Piazza, uh, and please uh, format your question in a way that's usable for other students, okay? Uh, as the CS451 session, uh, half of you were not supposed to be here because the, the capacity was half of what we have today. I agreed to increase the capacity to almost double what it used to be, okay? Because the, the pre-registration, I think that's called, is it pre-enrollment or registration? That's what, what it's called. We had a lot of demand and the demand keeps going up and I try to accommodate as much as possible, but we also have TA shortage. So, we have to be careful. We have to make the process as efficient as possible. So when you ask questions, please make it in a way that others can also use your question. And when you want to ask questions, please read Piazza first to make sure that it's not already answered. And I really appreciate the student answers on Piazza because it helps me and TAs to save time. I will read all of the answer. I will either uh, endorse it or I will uh, add more explanation, okay? So you can trust the answers. So that would be really uh, helpful for us. 
If you have a private question, again, use Piazza, just uh, change visibility to instructors. If you want only me to see it, you can also pick me. But if you just have a question, a private question, for example, you don't want to reveal your implementation, just make it private and set visibility to instructors so that me and TAs can see it. If you have something private for me, you can just set it to just my name, okay? Lectures and office hours will be on Teams. Uh, I will post more information about office hours uh, later on Piazza. So uh, I talked a little bit about this. So the course is about algorithm design. So and, and not about teaching you about big data frameworks such as Hadoop and Spark. I will teach you Hadoop and Spark, but it does not meant to be a full course on those systems, right? Each of them require at least one course, okay? So it's impossible for me to teach everything. So uh, what we you will learn in lectures is algorithm design and some examples, but when you do the assignments, we expect you to learn a little bit on your own, okay? And uh, uh, figure out basically how the API works exactly. Uh, the final grade, uh, so we have eight uh, assignments, individual assignments for CSS students and seven assignments for non-CSS students. These are separate sets of assignments. And there's a final group project uh, that it can be up to three students. It can be individual, two or three students. Okay, it's up to you. But again, because I, I allowed many students <laughs> I really appreciate if you form groups. It's good for you and it's also good for me because I have to mark them at the end of the term. And right now we have only 100 students just in CS 451 section, okay? So, and final projects, I want to mark them myself just to be fair to everyone. So it's a lot of workload for me. So having group projects will help me a lot. And we have weekly quizzes. Uh, um, and uh, that will start from next week, but it will we will have a quiz every week. Uh, on, it will be on Learn. Unfortunately, Learn does not notify you properly when the quiz becomes available, so it's possible, completely possible, that you forget about it. So please set an alarm for weekly quizzes so that you don't forget them. I will post the weekly quiz by Friday noon, okay? It might be a little bit earlier, but I try my best to post it by Friday noon. So you can set your alarm for sometime after Friday noon, it will be there. And it will be due next Monday. It's usually the afternoon, so it's like around 4 p.m. of the next Monday. I'll provide more information. But in general, this is how it is going to be. There's no weekly quiz this week. It will start next week. So I will not accept any excuse for missing weekly quizzes, okay? Obviously health related stuff, but if you forget about it, uh, there, there won't be any exception. Uh, we have a question here. Are groups uh, even for grad? Yes, so both, all sections can have, there's a little bit difference in the nature, I, I would say, the, the, the group, but in general, yes, we have um, group projects for all sections. Uh, how long are quiz, uh, quizzes supposed to take? So these are very short quizzes, okay? And the idea behind it is that to make sure that you follow lectures, all right? So if you attend lectures or you watch lectures, you should be able to write the quizzes in one to two minutes. So I, did, I don't put any time restriction. So, so that you are relaxed, but you don't need more than a few minutes to answer if you attend lectures. So these are like very simple questions typically from lectures. Uh, so are the deadlines for each assignment listed on the course website? Yes, uh, I'll show you the website in a second since right now it's only listed to this for seven assignments and not eight. So uh, no, there are eight assignments, right? They start from assignment zero if that's the problem. Uh, let's check to make sure. I will show the website in a sec. Okay, expectations, your background. So for CSS students in 451, 651, we expect you to be comfortable in Java and Scala or be ready to pick it up quickly, okay? Because these are the languages that you are going to use for your assignments. 
For non-CSS students in 431, 631, we expect you to know Python or be ready to pick it up, pick it up quickly. Uh, you should be uh, interested in the topic. It's sometimes it can be a little bit difficult, but if you're really interested in this topic, it, it is nice. It, it's, it's nice to work with these problems. These sorts of problems is fun, okay? But you need to put the time. Uh, and uh, basically, this is a very evolving ecosystem, uh, and uh, uh, you should be comfortable with things like making sure this is a proper version, things like that. You're not using an old version, thing, things like that. So uh, this is the expectation. Very important here. I, I did not have this slide in previous terms I, because I thought it's obvious, but let me be clear here. I am a very nice guy with the exception of this slide. OK, so if you don't want to see the other side of me, don't think about cheating. OK, so uh, it, it will be it will have very bad consequences. You will lose the mark on that assignment. Uh, it will lose mark on the final grade. OK, the reason it's important is that I'm telling you the, here. This is no secret. I may reuse some of the assignments from last terms. There might be repositories from previous uh, students available. I tried my best to shut them down. I think they are down. It's possible that one of them pop up. Don't even think about looking at the code. Like Honestly, I had the students who looked at the code in the previous terms, and then they did the assignment on their own, but the software that we use found that there are similarities. The problem with these type of problems is, is that when you look at the code, it's very difficult to write it in another way. And even if you do it on your own, it will be considered cheating at the end of the day. The software is sensitive. It finds the, the, the logical similarity between the code, not the comments or different variables. So it finds all similarities, OK? And uh, to be fair to all the students who really spend time doing assignments, I will make sure that I do this even more seriously than before, OK? And uh, so just make sure don't do, right? Don't look at any code online. It's fine to look at the Stack Overflow, right? That's how I code, all right? So uh, and if you use a lot, just cite it in your code that I use this part from Stack Overflow because uh, because the, the software will find these similarities. OK, so I have the assignments from all of the previous terms and I have obviously all of your submissions. So the software will cross check everything. And it will find similarities very easily. So don't think about it, please. This is a fun course, OK? And assignments are super important, and they complete the comp uh, complete lectures because there are concepts that it doesn't matter how many hours I talk about, you will learn them when you do the assignment, OK? I bet there will be many moments that say, oh, this is what he was talking about when you were doing the assignment, OK? So it helps you to, uh, to understand these concepts. And there are many students already on the waiting list for this course, OK? So despite increasing the capacity. So if you're really interested in the course, please don't cheat. Uh, and if you want to cheat, please drop the course. Let other students uh, enroll. All right, we have a question. It is, uh, is it Java and Scala or Java or Scala? Unfortunately, it's and. And that was a good question. We have a slide on it. So this is for 451, 651 students only. Uh, uh, so non-CSS students can have a break for one minute. OK, so in CS, uh, the CS version of the course, we use Hadoop, which uses Java, and we also use Spark, which uses Scala uh, for the programming language. I have a warning for you from the students in previous terms. At the beginning of the term, you have some free time. Try to learn a Scala. The Scala will not appear until assignment two, if I'm not mistaken. So don't wait until then. Start immediately if you don't know a Scala. You don't need to know very 
advanced concepts, like basic things is fine. Just make sure that you're comfortable with the language, okay? Because it's uh, it's a little bit awkward. Uh, we will use private Git repositories. The first assignment, which is assignment zero, will help you set up, okay? So that we don't run into issues later on. So don't worry about this. The A0 will explain this to you. There's, uh, if you submit your assignment late, you will get zero. I make sure that I, I uh, make the assignment available at least two weeks before the due date so that you have a lot of time to work on it. Don't let it, uh, don't just start late, okay? Uh, please use the office hours. Uh, it will be problematic if you start like working on it like a day before and we won't be able to help you that much, right? Because it's not guaranteed that like two hours before the deadline, me and TAs have time to to answer questions, right? But throughout the week or two weeks, we can answer all of your questions. So, uh, so that's about that. I think the only exception will be A0, which is due next Friday. I will post it sometime tomorrow, probably. It's a basic assignment and I will add a tutorial for it um, later. Uh, I will talk about the concepts in A0 more next session, but you can start looking at the assignment and start working on it. For the rest of them, you have at least two weeks. All right. Uh, for non-CSS students, 431, 631, we will use Python and Jupyter Notebook. Specifically, we use Google Colab for uh, for development, and uh, we use private Git repositories. Again, assignment zero is designed to help you set up all of these things to make sure that you don't run into problems, and we will use Python. So I so I didn't have no we didn't have any tutorials on Java and Scala as I said the expectation is that you can pick it up on your own uh, so there are many tutorials available online we did not see the point to develop our own uh, tutorial because there are a ton of them out out there and they're really good someone just said that okay again no late assignments for you guys because there's a, I think one assignments less the time is even more so I try to post it at least two weeks you have two or three weeks to do the science and finally uh, we have only one required textbook which is av available uh, online for free and there are some addition uh, um, optional books that depending on what you want to learn Hadoop Spark you can use them so this this book this is the older book. It's good for fundamental concepts, but it, it uses a as an older version of a Spark. So the code is different. But for learning the concept, it's a good book. But for code, you should use the, the newer books. Uh, I have checked all of these, and uh, all of these uh, optional books are also available through the library for free. So you don't have to pay anything for textbooks. So for learning, so there's a question about having links to good uh, tutorials for Hadoop. So I teach basic stuff for Hadoop and Spark. I have, I will have tutorials for them, specifically for Spark. Um, and then you can refer to these books as well. I think these are really nice, uh, nice books. Because everything is a structure. There are tutorials on the internet, but they talk about one topic and not the other one. So, but these books are really nice. They talk about everything. In terms of um, in terms of learning, as I said, you need to learn the API a little bit on your own, right? So you can just search online and just look at Hadoop or uh, Spark documentation. You should not use anything else for doing the assignments. If you want to learn more. Uh, about these uh, systems, these books are really good. Yes, and also this, you saw this on my desktop. That's true because we play games uh, uh, during the term as well. I'll, I will update you about that as well. We have some social events because it's online and we cannot chat outside the lectures, so we try to make it a little bit more fun. So let's have a quick look at 
the webs, what happened? What's happening to the website? Um, all right, there you go. So this is a course website. You know it, and we have Piazza. Hopefully all of you are already registered uh, on Piazza and uh, make sure that you register for the correct section. Then we have uh, some of the stuff that I talked about here, the box. And this is uh, also interesting for you. So you know the breakdown for the final mark, how much the project is worth and things like that. I'll talk more about the project. I will release the project in a few weeks. It's too early now. So in a few weeks, I will release the project and you'll get all of the information that you need. Um, that's about that. So the syllabus page is probably the, the, the one that we refer to the most. Uh, I will update this throughout the term. So this is the plan for this uh, term and the dates and the assignment uh, deadlines. So as you can see, one, two, three, yeah, so seven, so eight. It, it's, uh, it starts from zero. You are computer scientists. And then, so here, zero to six, so seven here. So uh, the reason it's A0 is that it's not a real assignment, okay? It's a uh, mini assignment just to let you know the system, things like that. Um, and I post my slides, uh, which also work as course note. So it's a slide and sometimes I have a little bit of a note under the slide to explain in case you want to look at them. These days we have the recorded video, so you don't really need to refer to them but in case you want. And we have some readings and optional readings, things like that I will post. So it's already available for all of the topics. The slides are not ready yet. I will upload them usually a few days before the lecture. And also these are links to the assignments. So they are not work, they don't work right now. I will, they become available as we, um, as I post the assignments. All right, so let me stop sharing my screen. What I will do, and I move you guys here so that I can see you when we talk. Uh, okay. Let's, let me see if I miss any question. So clean desktop, you should see my tablet. It's, uh, I don't use this machine a lot. Uh, can we have, can we make groups across sections? No, because uh, the projects are different, so you can't. And uh, when will the available dates and due dates be updated for the assignment? So the due dates are there, so we just saw the due dates. And I post the assignment assignments usually as soon as I cover the topic, which will be two weeks before. With the exception of maybe A1 might be a little bit closer, but generally like two weeks. And so the way uh, I'm going to handle the lectures is that I'm going to target one hour like today. It might be a little bit longer. Uh, Online learning, more than one hour doesn't work. So uh, uh, sometimes uh, we need a little bit more time, but I'll target one hour. It may go to uh, one hour, 10 or even 15 minutes in some sessions. Um, and I will finish the lecture. I will keep recording for a while. So if you have more lecture related questions, you can ask if you, per if you prefer not to be recorded when you ask, then I stop recording uh, after I answer a few questions. And I will stay a little bit longer to simulate walking from the lecture hall to the hallway and still talking to students, okay? So uh, that will be uh, the plan. Yeah, and I will do the same thing for today. Uh, there's a question, Ali, go ahead. Um, hi, I was wondering uh, your thoughts about uh, CS454 distributed systems, the other distributed systems course and how it compares to this one. There isn't much overlap. If you if you want to take that course, uh, that's a separate topic. I'll talk a little bit about it, uh, like in one or two lectures, but other than that, completely different. Like is it is this is it like this course is more this course is more applied and the other one is more theory or uh, no I think that one is also applied 
as much as I know, uh, but our focus is on big data, right? So they their focus is not on big data that much. So we care about, okay, I have a data set that is too big. How can we process it? For them, it's about distributed system. So it's Amazon. They have like millions of users. How can they support such a system, okay. right? So that's the difference. Okay, thank you. No problem. Let me go back to chat. Uh, so for the final project, I will. There's a post on Piazza that will help you find teammates. Okay, I will make that visible as soon as I post project. So there, you can just say you can introduce yourself, and then others can also comment. Or that that will be the place for you to link to other students. And uh, A zero is not posted yet. It will be tonight or tomorrow. Uh, don't worry about it. So A0 is a very small assignment and I recommend doing it after the next session. But I will post it so that you can have a look. So more questions. Uh, so for CS631, uh, Last time I checked, there were only three or four spots available. I emailed those students who are unlikely to enroll yesterday, I believe. And I believe that I emailed the rest of them that have some good chance to be enrolled in the course, but there aren't many spots available, unfortunately. Uh, sections, yes, different, like 451, 651, correct. So, uh, someone is recommending groups on Learn. I haven't used it, but I will look into it to see. So, I will also post like an informal session. So, I, ha I didn't have time to post on it, post about it uh, sooner. But we typically have like an informal session that we basically get together and talk about random things, games, things like that, our hobbies and to know each other a little bit better. Again, uh, not the best environment <laughs> here for knowing people, right? So that will help a little bit as well. Now I'll, I'll post about it, so watch for it because it can be tomorrow night or tomorrow morning. So the, the capacity uh, has increased already, and I cannot increase it further. It's not possible at this time. We won't have the support the staff to do it, unfortunately. So the course will be offered next term as well. So if someone wants to enroll, they couldn't. Uh, I will teach it again, most probably next term as well. Unless your uh, course evaluations are really bad and they kick me out of yeah. So that's, that's there's a condition. All right, so that's fine. So let me stop recording. I will be around a little bit more. Feel free to leave if you want.